Hi, everybody. Welcome to Episode 7 of The Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger Pang. Hello. And we are going to have follow-ups, I think, today about travel as an, as an academician. That we talked about, vaca- or not necessarily just travel, but vacation. We are going to talk about an opinion piece that was just published, I think, earlier this week in PNAS. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is titrating the grant to paper ratio. So, but we'll start with, I think, follow ups about vacation. Right. And we also had some follow ups about social media, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, or okay. modern forms of communication. Okay. Which okay. Is, I guess related to this. Okay. Opinion piece. So, uh, so I just for the for the vacation thing, I feel like so last episode, episode six, we talked about kind of taking vacation, what how to how to do it <laughs> optimally, and I feel like I, I we didn't quite talk about it in the context of you know how we did things when we were like you know newborn assistant professors, and so I thought it would be useful just to kind of if we could think back that far to like you know how you approached it when you were an assistant professor as opposed to how you might approach it now as a you know, tenured full professor. Right. I think I was certainly more worried about taking time away. I did. I certainly did take vacation, mm-hmm. but I was more worried about it. And there's been a shift in terms of the kind of work that I might need to deal with while I'm away. So when you're an assistant professor, you um, you're not getting a lot of requests from other people. At least I wasn't. It's more that you are needing things from other people right. rather than them needing something from you. And along with that is that you can take time away and not get a lot of emails and not have a lot of people pestering you, but you feel like it's potentially precious time that's slipping away where you should be finishing that manuscript or working on your grant. Mm-hmm. So then the, the difference is as you get further along in your career, the proportion of your emails are, are people asking you for things. And then when you go away on vacation, you're, at least for me, I'm less worried about should I be finishing that manuscript or working on the grant. And I'm more concerned that uh, my collaborators or my team need something from me mm-hmm. that um, they need, and, and they may need it in a timely manner if it's related to a study participant or. Um, who's enrolled in one of our studies. So that's that was the paradigm kind of shift. And early on, um, I probably, I was able to kind of unplug to a certain extent, but there was always that kind of sense of, you know, I, I just left two days ago and I left in the middle of, you know, having a draft of a paper done. Right. And is it really wise to not lift a finger for, 10 days or whatever, because right. it's going to take me time to get my head back into it when I get back to work. But it was important to to step away. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, that's exactly actually what I was going to say, which is like, you know, when I was an assistant professor, like you're, you don't have this kind of complex web of relationships and collaborators and, and, and kind of things that you're doing that kind of makes it difficult to extract yourself out where you like usually at least when I was an assistant professor I could just walk away and like you know no one would ever know <laughs> <laughs> and so some, in some ways that's good because you know you're, you're much more in control of, of your time and everything and now you know it's like it's you have to find that exact moment when all when the stars and the moon align and then you can just kind of leave so um um, yeah, so anyway, I think that, that is, a, I think, one of the key differences there. So I think if you're an assistant professor, I think that's one thing that you probably should think about is that, you know, um, yes, there is a clock in some sense ticking, um, but, um, but you do have some benefits in the sense that you're not, like, embroiled in this, in this enormous kind of web of kind of complexity in terms of your research. Un- like, unless that story that you told about being in Europe and being unplugged, because you were an assistant professor then. Yeah, I kind of yeah, I got something. From I did you. get dragged into that. Yeah, yeah. So that was not my choice. Right. But uh, but one example, for example, you know, like more recently, I, I a couple years ago, you know, I was on vacation and uh, and like a st- uh, one of my students needed a letter a letter of recommendation for uh, I think for a job I can't remember what it was and you know the, there's like deadlines for that right and I, and luckily it was like at the end of the vacation so I could kind of come back and just do it right away but like you don't have those problems if you know if you don't have students for example. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so it just there's it, it just tra- things just trade off as you go on through the career, and I think um, so it's it's not like it's always better one way or the other. Right. I think. Yeah. All right. And then I guess in terms of the um, following up on the social media types, so I think I felt like last time we mostly talked about Twitter. 
Um, but there are some other forms. Um, and the main one I kind of wanted to just bring up was blogging. I think a lot of people ask me, you know, what does it take to write a blog or should I do it? And because, you know, I have a blog that I share with two other colleagues here. And, uh, and I usually tell them that if they're going to do it, they should not do it alone. Um, and, and that any real blog that's kind of worth its salt is a, essentially a job. Um, and, uh, and, and then it will be kind of, and then most of the time it's fun at first. And then you realize that the God, this is really just like a job. It's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. And so it's nice to have people to share that job with, um, so that you're not shouldering the burden of kind of coming up with content every single time. <clears throat> but I mean, even in the, even then people get busy and it can be hard even for multiple people to kind of come up with some good content. So, um, you have to think a little, ultimately, do you want this to be like a component of your job? Because it won't be good unless it is, I think. Although I can say the downs, there's there's hardly any risk to starting one and yes. then not having it continue or no. take off, right? There's no, there's, there's no risk. I right. Think. I mean, you're right. welcome to start. I, anyone can start a blog now. It used to be a lot harder. It used to be more like kind of startup cost to start right. a blog. Well, now, I figured out how to do it last week. Well, yeah, exactly. Now there's all these services. You click a button right. and you have a blog. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, so that's my only thing is that like, you know, in the near term, there's no risk or or any term there's no risk but if you want to kind of sustain if you want it to be sustainable it's going to require a lot of of your effort that will that will be effort that you can't you know use doing something else so that's my only thought about blogging i think did you want are there any other, any other formats really there's really nothing really like people don't really use facebook or anything like that for work not so much. I mean, not the, not people. Well, at least not my face. My right. friends on yeah. Facebook. Maybe there's some. Yeah, maybe one day we'll have the Snapchat ap- academic. Right, right, right. Well, there is this interesting phenomenon that I don't participate in all in at all, where LinkedIn is trying to be more of a forum. Yeah. For that sort of thing. Yeah. But I and I'm not sure whether that's mainly business people who. <coughs> Who are are posting on LinkedIn? Have you ever posted something on LinkedIn? Uh, nothing really substantial, no. Yeah, but it's more of a business connection kind of thing. Uh, right. I, I don't think there's a lot of academic stuff going on in on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, so I think that's it for the follow up, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So do you, so we were going to talk about this opinion piece, and I can give like a brief intro about it. So. This was, and, and this paper made a little bit of rounds on Twitter. So this is an opinion piece in PNAS, and it's written by uh, Donald and Stuart Geeman. Geeman. And they are both um, in you know, professors, one at Hopkins, one at Brown in applied math. And the premise of this opinion piece is essentially that we uh, have not really had the amazing sort of breakthrough discoveries in science, say, in the last few decades or so that we had before. And their hypothesis that they put forward about this is that the reason we haven't is because of kind of how lives of scientists have changed in terms of, like, it's more frenetic in terms of communication and self-promotion and their forces that um, evaluate people kind of on numbers of papers or you know, those sorts of metrics rather than kind of quality. That there's less of a value put on time alone to, <coughs> to think, basically, to do pure science and discovery. So that's, I think, that's what I got out of it in a nutshell. But. Right. And I think when you sent me, or no, actually, I saw this on Twitter, actually. Right. And I, and I immediately looked at it. And, I, and then after I read it, I think I immediately emailed it to you and say, we have to talk about this. It, I feel like this piece was tailor-made for this podcast. <laughs> Cause, did, did you plant something? Because you know these guys. Yeah, did no, you? no. So, yeah, so Don Geeman, he's a colleague, obviously. You know, I've talked to him a couple of times. But, no, I have never talked to him about this yeah, piece. So you did not email him and say, I have this new podcast. Would yeah, you write it? Yeah, I need it? help, Yeah. <laughs> Can you just publish something in PNAS to like right. you know help me out? Um, so uh, it, so I was going to read a little bit from the piece just from the beginning, and it starts off saying you know a time traveler from 1915 arriving in 1965 uh, would have been astonished by the scientific theories and engineering technologies invented during that half century. One can only speculate, but it seems likely that few of the major advances that emerged during those 50 years were even remotely foreseeable in 1915. And then he goes on to talk about a lot of the stuff that happened during that time period. Um, then later he says, um, would a visitor from 1965, having traveled the 50 years to 2015, be equally dazzled? 
Um, and then he says, um, this is not to deny that our, tra he said, probably not, but this is not to deny that our time traveler would find the internet, new medical imaging devices, advances in molecular biology and gene editing, verification of gravity waves, inventions and discoveries, or these inventions and discoveries are remarkable. Um, but um, the advances are mostly incremental, largely focused on newer and faster ways to gather and store information, communicate, or be entertained. So, I, you know, there have been a number. Of, so I read this piece and, uh, you know, it goes on to talk about how the life of the academic has changed quite a bit. And as you mentioned, just kind of a little bit more and kind of more frenetic. And, and there's been a shift in terms of how um, people are evaluated as academics. And, um, and, and one example of, that he gives of kind of the, the value of kind of thinking alone and not necessarily like, you know, working with lots of people is like these two mathematicians who solve these long standing mathematical problems. Um, and they basically kind of live by themselves. One guy, I think, lived with his mother at home, and it was not affiliated with any institution at all. Uh, and um, and so anyway, but they managed to solve these big problems. So um, so this piece, you know, I, I was telling you before we started that this, I think this piece was tailor made to get me upset. <laughs> right, and I don't because I see a lot of I I don't know if the reasons that they cite for there not being the kind of breakthroughs that 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 have been had, you know, in in the earlier 20th century are true in, in terms of the, uh, that they're the cause of that. But I do think that what they describe in terms of our our work lives is a absolutely true. Yeah. So I, so I think that, so for people who read the piece, I think the description of how the academic life has changed is a fact, right? Right. So, there's nothing to dispute there, really. Well, right, but so you <laughs> think it's good, or and he thinks they, 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 they're positive. They, they basically are saying this is not a good thing that it's changed in this way. I think, and I would actually agree with that. That's not what I. That's not what made me upset in this piece. Um, but two things that made me upset. One is that they never talk. So they they never ask the question of really of why this change has occurred, mm -hmm. right? And the second. Is, and as a result, because they don't ask why this change occurred, their kind of proposed solutions are very just, they have no proposed, right. uh, uh, they have no proposals for how to either reverse this trend right. or change it altogether. Right. All they say at the end is like, maybe we should think about how to, we should rethink how to evaluate people in academia. Right. Um, so why do you think this has changed so over time? I've had a lot of discussions about this kind of thing. And what bothers me about pieces like this, and there's, this has not been the only one, is that it kind of points all the, it points all the blame within the academy <laughs> in mm -hmm. some sense, you right. know, that, we're, that somehow we are just worse people than we used to be. Right. Like some, we're just horrible people now. Right? And then the ac academics of the earlier part of the 20th century, they were wonderful people and just better at thinking than we were. Right. I mean, that's the conclusion that we can draw because we, of course, we evaluate each other. So if we're evaluating each other in a worse way, then like we're worse. <laughs> right. Um, and so and that's kind of what bothers me. I, I mean, maybe we're maybe we're a little bit worse. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, uh, you know, and actually, uh, I, I, uh, you know, we've written actually we've written about this on our blog. So, I mean, the, I think the fundamental issue that people don't want to talk about is money. Right. And, and how. The, the size of the academy is bigger now uh, in terms of just faculty all told. Uh, but the amount of money is, yes, there is more money, but the amount of money per member of the academy is less. It's dramatically less. I mean, you look at the NIH budget, you look at the number of people being trained as, even just in biology, it's skyrocketed, but the NIH budget is far from skyrocketed. So it's sort right. of a basic concept of when there are scant resources. Stuff happens. Stuff happens. Yeah. But I think the other thing that, and I think it's related to, to what um, you, you just brought up about scant resources, and I think I tweeted about this, is that what they don't include here is that, to a large extent, a huge chunk of our money comes from federal government sources and some foundations, and that those sources, um, things have become frenetic in that world, too. Yeah. And so... When when agencies are sort of fighting for a big piece of the pie, they want to be able to say, look, we've had a gazillion papers published that have been linked to our grants. And so there's, there is the, the government system works this way, too. Like a, a congressperson right. well, wants to see yeah. many, many papers, right. which is very different from uh, being in a position to be able to discern quality. Right. 
And that, that trickles down yes. to yes. eventually to the level of the investigator yes. at some university. And I think um, and I think it's I think it's worth noting, you know, to go back in time a little bit. So he compares two periods, nineteen fifteen to nineteen sixty five and then uh, 1965 to 2015. And, but you have to add, like, what, there's one major event that happened between 1915 and 1965 <laughs> that didn't replicate itself, really, in its following 50 years, and that was World War II, right? And a lot of, I mean, that was that just kind of an anomaly in American history, I think, in terms of there was a tremendous amount of military interest in a lot of different areas of science. Um, and then, and there was also kind of a general national mood to kind of, like, I, don't, I guess to... The, the national mood was different, I guess, back then, right. is what I would say. And funding for science and engineering was kind of at its all-time high. And you think about, um, and this kind of bled into the private industry. So you look at like Silicon Valley um, and and a lot of these kind of uh, te- technology industrial centers all grew out of kind of World War II, basically. And so um, it's kind of, I don't know, so it's, it's, I feel like it's unfair to compare that period to this period right. because they're so different. And the national mood was so different. You know, you, you, in, the, in the 60s, you had like the space program, you know, the Apollo era. And, and many people thought that was a waste of money, but we still got, you know, a lot of interesting engineering out of it. Um, and so, um, so that's, there's that. Number two is, I don't think, I, I feel like wow, his... Wow, you... you <laughs> I've thought about this a little. You've thought about this a little. <laughs> the, the second thing is, I, his list of things that were discovered in the first 50 years, as opposed to the second 50 years, like I can discern no difference in importance between those two lists of mm-hmm. things. Like the internet, I think, is an amazing thing. And right. it's not what you might consider classical, like a classical discovery. Right. Um, but it's still an incredible kind of invention, I guess. Um, the internet blows my mind. Almost, yeah. almost on a daily almost basis. Almost on a daily basis, right. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, there's, there's, the, uh, there's that. And I think, um, I, think t- I, I, I feel like a lot of academics have been conditioned to, to think that Okay, this we should just take as a, we should just accept this fact that there's an X amount of dollars going into academia, and then we should just um, and then work within that boundary. And I'm not saying that I can personally change that, but um, the fact we have to recognize that you know that I think the, uh, that the kind of funding coming into the our work is just a lot not what it used to be, and. And, and think about okay, what? How does that play a role in terms of what we do right. to it, change and, things? Right, and it has a term, and, and I think we'll get to that about this grant to paper t- mm-hmm. ratio titration is related to that, but it has a direct impact. So, I so my father was an academician, and so his sort of heyday was like 70, 1970s, early eighties. The <coughs> the division chief who hired me was about the same age. He's in his mid seventies. And my mentor was about the same age. And so that was a period of time in academia where resources were not tight and the typical kind of pace was very different for them. And I remember this growing up is, um, and part of it was that there was not necessarily, you weren't attached to technology. You may bring like a hard copy of a paper home that mm-hmm. actually may have been a reprint that someone mailed you and That's right, signed yeah, you, right? You, you, signed. You, you mailed them a letter asking for the yes, reprint. Yes, yes. And they wrote an autograph, you know, on they, they wrote some little note. Right. Like, um, so, but the model was, uh, so my former division chief had a lab with one tech, a postdoc, would, there'd usually be one postdoc or a grad student in there, and he would write an R01 or renew his R01 every four to five years or so. And he just maintained that R01 for 30 years. And in between, he had time to, you know, there'd be time in his office to think about whatever the next idea or hypothesis was. And that whole model has been just completely blown out of the water. Yeah. And And I think you also have, there's a additional component of just the the state of healthcare and the state of kind of clinical right. work. Right, right. Yeah. And so there's more and more pressure to see more and more patients, even if you're grant funded, actually, right. because that's a, a revenue driver for the for a medical school. So I think it is different. And then I remember my father would occasionally go in on a Saturday, and actually there was a big, like, huge computer. It was back in the 1970s, and I was playing some crazy adventure, right. or, like, reality game, yeah. and I'd have to type in a command. Yeah. You know, it was all... Like, like a text-based game. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but that would be just for a few hours or, right. or what have you. And like I said, he would bring papers home. And But it was a very different... 
sense than what it is now where um, people are on email at all hours. Um, there, I think, is less and less time where people do have time to think in their offices. Yeah. And there's a lot of, um, you, I think people can feel like they're running on a gerbil wheel. And I, yeah. I think that's not such it's not such a healthy thing but yeah. it's also i i agree with the premise that that's this is not a good thing for yeah. science generally do i think it explains you know what they see as um you know the authors see as a sort of reduction in in you know achievements i don't i don't think so but i do think it's a problem yeah i think it's a problem even if it, forget about the inventions and right. discoveries right. it's just a problem for our kind of general right. well-being. Right. Um, so how would you fix it? So you, the implication of what you're saying is you would fix it by channeling more money. Well, we have to first ask the question, why is there less money? Right. And I think, you know, there's a lot of answers to that question in terms of politics, in terms of our society, our culture, and things like that. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to bring up, the last thing I, before I forget, is that so Gary King, you know, who's a political scientist at Harvard, he wrote a, an editorial a couple years back in Science, I think, about the, the kind of like, I can't remember what the exact topic of the paper was, and I'll find the link, but it was kind of like, the, in some sense, the kind of coming crisis in academia, which is, and if you think about all the major funding streams, the typical ma funding streams of an academic institution, education, government funding, um, sorry, tuition, government funding, philanthropy, all of those avenues are under pre either under pressure or declining, right? Tuition is perceived to be, you know, too high in most places, so that's under tremendous pressure to be reduced. Um, philanthropy is kind of hit or miss at best, I think, and government funding is for sure going down. Um, and then you have things like uh, nonprofits, which are you know are not the same as all these other sources. So it's when you when every single funding stream. I mean, if you were to run a business and every revenue stream was under pressure or going down, like that would be a cause for a concern. Right, right. right? Well, also I think and, there's a whole belief among sort of academic medicine community or worry that the new model will be that there will be a large proportion of people who are on what's called a clinician educator track mm -hmm. where they see patients and then, you know, for a good chunk of time, maybe 50% or 60% of the time and the rest of their time, they do educational work or some research kind of supportive role that they play. And then there'll be a very small number of people who fit the traditional model of spending, you know, 80% of their time on research. Mm -hmm. And that the number of people like that is going to shrink in order for um, academic medical <coughs> institutions to survive down the road. Yeah, the number of people are kind of really focusing right. on research. Right. Yeah. So I mean I think so part of the of so part of the problem is that you know that's that's this is why we have all the now we have a, a relatively a more recent problem is kind of this issue of all these adjunct faculty you know why do we have all these adjunct faculties because people you know universities have had to figure out new revenue streams in terms of either online courses or like or part time classes and often these classes are taught by adjuncts um, and, and adjuncts are less expensive well they they are paid less. No, you don't think they're way, you... one way to put it. Yes. Um, and uh, and uh, and so they're the kind of that's another way for universities to make money. And whether or not that's you know, there's different ways to think about that. But I think it's obviously that. But that phenomenon is a result of these kind of declining revenue streams uh, in all the other areas. So um, so I think you know it's there's a discussion to be had of kind of about what to do. But I think what upset me most about the piece is that they provide no basis to kind of start that discussion really. Right. Um, because they don't try to, it's just, to there, me, it's the, a piece, rant. the piece comes off as a, as like, as a slightly better blog post, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is what blogs are made for, uh -huh. <laughs> but I guess they could write it to PNAS, so, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a bit of a rant, and it's a bit of, it's a lot of kind of complaining, I feel like, but there's no analysis there, mm -hmm. or, or even a, it gives you no kind of prescription for kind of what to think about or what to do next, right, right, and so it doesn't help. That any, it help, doesn't help the discussion. It doesn't help our cause, I think, to, to, come, to talk about all these things and talk about how academia is horrible. Right. Um, it only hurts our cause because then other people see this and they say, okay, well, why? And if we're going to come out and say, oh, yes, but we, now we need more money right, to do right. the research, they're, right. they're going to say, why? You guys are horrible people. You know? <laughs> I, I didn't take from it that like there was anything about this generation of scientists that were being maligned. But I, I thought it was really more about the climate 
you know, that was being maligned. Uh, maybe it's because you and I are different generations. Are we, though? We've talked about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm Gen X. I'm, and you're I, not a millennial. Uh, no, I'm in between. I, I, we did, actually, we, I had a discussion about this yesterday. My generation, so to speak, got you're, caught in between. Oh, you're no a lost name. generation. We had, well, we had bad marketing, right? We like Gen Y does it. It's kind of lame, right? Oh, you're Gen Y. I mean, I think in principle I would be. But right? Gen Y does, is the but, same as the millennials. No, is it really? I thought it was. Oh, okay. We're, so we're Gen X had marketing, but it was about how we were slackers. Yeah, well, of course you are, but like every every next generation is a bunch of slackers. Right, right, right. So, right. Um, yeah, I think my my group had bad marketing, so never got a good label. Right. So anyway, all right. So I think I don't know. That's that's. So I got to rant. <laughs> so Don Gaiman can rant to PNAS, and I can rant on my podcast. Yes. Right. <laughs> this is true. This yeah. is true. This yeah. is the, the the generational change right, here. Right. Right. <laughs> So how would you? So you ranted, but but what you? One of the things you ranted about was that they did not offer any sort of suggestions to think about how to fix it. Yeah. So you're ranting about how they didn't offer this. But yeah. Do you have solutions? Well, I, I have some thoughts. I don't okay. Have, like I don't have canned solutions. To right, right, right. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do think that um, the kind of existing revenue streams. Where do you think of them as? You know, educate. Let's say tuition and you know government funding. Those, I don't think that we can go back to them. You know, we can't say we can't go back to the students and say, you know, we're just going to raise your tuition. And I don't think we can go back to the government and say we need another X billion dollars in research funding. It's the political climate is such that it would be. It seems like it would be difficult to pull that off in a short term. Right. Um, the other so, solution, which is a war. No, no, no. Well, I, I'm totally being <laughs> facetious. Yeah. It's not also obviously a. Well, I actually, I re, there, yeah, there are some theories, kind of economic theories, about how every once in a while, like the, like, I think there was a recent paper that said, like, you know, the, the one, one way that inequality can be kind of realigned is like if there's a war. If there's a war, um, but, but maybe um, there are other. I but guess, anyway, that's off topic for right. this podcast. But I think, but one of the things that we can think about, I think, is a lot of these technologies that he mentions that were developed in the last fifty years, um, whether they be the internet or whatever can potentially be used to generate new revenue streams. And I think and I'm hinting a little bit at this, but, you know, for example, one of the things that we've done here uh, with online classes um, is, to, uh, is to provide education at a low cost but at a high volume, right? So that's the opposite of what we do here, which is a high cost and low volume. Um, and so what, what you mean by that is you're talking about the Coursera Yeah, MOOCs, so these massive right? open online courses, um, they're not going to make anybody rich or or you know they're not going to support an entire university on their own, um, but they do provide a revenue stream, and they um, and they're very and they're some sense uh, efficient because you don't have to hire an army of adjunct faculty, um, and they're good for the students because they're extremely low cost, um, and so um, so that's just one example. I'm not saying that's the future, but, but I think the, even that little thing, uh, which may seem obvious to people in the tech world or in business, um, I think was a tremendous effort. For this, for the university, kind of move forward on. So that requires that universities really become much more forward thinking, maybe than some of them are. Yes. Be- because, you know, for example, the if we use the Coursera MOOCs as a case study, that was not initiated by the institution. That was initiated by you and your colleagues who do that. Well, well, to be fair, no. I mean, the institution was approached. Oh, they, okay. Yeah, by the company. And they, uh, and and so it wasn't like we initiated the okay. thing. You know, but we we were just one of the first people to kind of really engage, I guess, right. in, the, in this process. Right. Uh, and, and I think, to, I think even to this day, we, we're probably the only ones who really enjoy it. <laughs> but I think it's also different because I think if, if the university came to me and say, oh, we need some faculty to do X, Y, and Z because the university sees it as diversifying their revenue stream, I would be skeptical of that as a faculty person because that's a risk for me to take. It's not really clear, you know, if, if I'm thinking purely about my own career, what what is it that I'm going to gain out of that. The university needs me to do sort of a favor for them because they're exploring this. This could blow up because 90% of these things blow up and don't turn into anything. And so it seems like there needs maybe to be more incentives for for universities to be very forward thinking and proactive about different opportunities, but also 
maybe to incentivize faculty to kind of participate in you know, you know, these ideas that they are pursuing. Yeah. Well, let me just to be fair, you know, I think one of the things that was a, a, a tremendous coincidence when the university came to us about this whole with MOOCs and Coursera is that we were already thinking about doing something like this for a long time and mm-hmm. it just happened to be that they came to us with a kind of on with a solution on a silver platter right. and so we jumped on it right. but we probably would have didn't, tried to do something like that anyway um, but uh, so it was a happy coincidence and mm-hmm. not every in fact, most opportunities will not be like that right. um, and, and so, so you can see why most faculty would say oh I'm not why would I be interested in that? I'm so busy doing other things. Yeah. and So I think one of the things that could be done, you know, there are a lot of faculty with actually with interesting ideas. And I think most of the time the university is very concerned. <laughs> you know, I, I often feel like the, the university is, like, is most concerned about – uh, you know about their faculty kind of ruining the ruining the reputation of the university in some sense, right? I mean, even though they the, the faculty kind of make the reputation of the university, the university well, is in some sense worried about. Them. Well, the faculty may go off and do things like start podcasts and <laughs> exactly right, you know, and tarnish the good name. Right. And so I think if the university were to let go of that just a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, obviously the the brand of Hop, of Johns Hopkins is something that I benefit from. Um, so, but if they let go of that a little bit and and kind of gave room for for kind of professors to kind of pursue some of these ideas, um, and that many of them probably wouldn't cost that much money, um, I, there could be a lot of newer things going on. I think, mm-hmm. and I think um, so. I, I see the whole Coursera thing as saying, as the university saying, "Hey, you know, we're, we're willing to let you guys do this because you know there's a mechanism, there's a company, et cetera, right. whatever the reason is." Um, and so, if they did that a little bit more often. I think maybe something good could come of it, financially speaking. Right. So anyway, that's my <laughs> – I have no other solutions. <laughs> so just throw me in the same bucket as Don uh, uh, okay. and <laughs> And you're going to apply for a provost job somewhere right now <laughs> to fix everything. That's right? right, yeah. All right. So the I think actually this is a good time to segue into the grant-to-paper ratio. Okay. Have you – I made this up. I don't know if we've ever talked about this before. No, I don't think so. I don't so, even know what you're talking about. You have about. no idea yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. So there's a phenomenon that I've noticed where people get, um, junior faculty get out of whack. Their grant-to-paper ratio gets out of whack. And okay. I don't know what, you know, should the ratio be 1? Should it be 0.5? I don't know what it should be except for that because of the lack of resources or the perceived lack of resources – um, and the, and people have just joined the faculty, so they're very worried, understandably, and there's some anxiety about whether they're going to have sustainable funding. Every time there's some opportunity to write a grant, <coughs> they write a grant. And it could be for a very modest amount of money, mm-hmm. and it could also be that they're trying to shoehorn what they do in to fit, you know, what that mechanism is looking for right and before you know it they have gotten into this revolving door of grant writing and they cannot get out and finish a paper right and that becomes very problematic for their careers and it's very it takes an incredible amount of kind of confidence in yourself and then confidence in sort of it'll work out or it won't work out to kind of sit on your hands and not go after every single grant opportunity and be much more strategic about the ones that you go after Mm -hmm. because it will hurt your productivity in terms of papers and you need papers to be promoted if Mm -hmm. we're purely talking about you know and this is this whole issue of yes people are going to count the numbers of papers you have and it does matter their quality and their impact but ultimately when you're just starting out you need to have some momentum in terms of some publications that are getting out well clearly you said you don't know what the optimal number is but clearly you have some sense of the range because Uh, otherwise you wouldn't be able to use phrases like out of whack right yes so 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 what is the difference between out of whack and and in in whack so since i'm not a a biostatistician (laughs) i just have this intuition about it yeah where i think um you know, maybe in a year's time, maybe you should write one to two grants tops, mm. and you should try to get a couple papers out. Okay. So maybe it's like 0. 0.75 or something like that. But I see people where it's like 
three grants to one, you know, paper <laughs> ratio, yeah. and that's a that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, also because you know grants incur a tremendous amount of overhead, both literally and just kind of, you know, um, in terms of you as a principal investigator and, and your need to manage people and manage resources to manage, you know, everything right. about each grant. Right. And yes, there are some synergies, kind of like when you have multiple grants, but not enough, I think. Well, many times a poor product is put in and there's no way you're going to get funded anyway because, you know, you say, oh, I'll just, you know, take this other thing I've written and sort of rearrange it and try to shoehorn it to get $20,000. Right. And you, and that whole time, if you had used those, that same amount of time to finish your manuscript draft. Right. You know, you would be in a different place. So, so, does this resonate with you at all, or does this seem? It does. Well, and I, 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 I want to ask you a side question. It's related, but um, you know, given our whole discussion about there's no more money, you know, <laughs> in our business, uh, I do. I talk to a lot of junior faculty who have an impression that, um, you know, that the that the that the kind of the tenure track and the kind of business, you know, the whole academic kind of endeavor is all is all about money. Um, and that the more money, that if you can be seen as a money machine, right, then that's all that matters, right. Um, and that you'll be promoted, and people will love you, and you're not going to have any problems. So if you if you're constantly, so they can, and often they'll cite so and so is bringing in thirty million dollars in this huge center grant or right. whatever, and and they're you know they're a big wig, right. they're a poobah, you know right. whatever, and um, and I think I I, I and. And so I, 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 you and I kind of work in slightly different worlds, uh, I think, when it comes to funding. Right. Um, and I think um, I know that in my world, uh, that is absolutely not true. But I, I'm willing to accept that maybe I live in an, a different world. You know, you can bring in any amount of money you want. If you don't have like a solid couple of papers, like it's not going to fly. Right, right. Um, and, uh, but I think, um, but there's an impression, I think, with a lot of junior faculty in a lot of areas that, that the only thing that you really, really need to do is bring in a ton of grants. Maybe that's the case. I don't think it's I, – I, I think that that's less – I would phrase it differently. I don't think it's that they believe that that's the only thing they need to do. But I think that they think that – they may think that it has more – um, sort of currency than it does, or it's given a tremendous it's amount of weight, and and overly so, right. I think in their minds, and and I and I would like to add another sort of like kind of more philosophical point here. And I was actually just having this discussion with um, a fellow in the last week or so, which is that, and I think we have talked a lot about this on the podcast in terms of okay, you have to write grants in order to fund your publications and the way you get promoted is, you know, you need to show that you have independent funding and that you um, have kind of an, you know, independent um, track of publications in some sort of specific area or area of focus. But what we don't often talk about, and I think we have to step back from, is that why are you, why is the faculty person doing this? And I think that's where this chasing the money thing comes. Why are they to doing be, what? Sorry. Why are they pursuing this this line of work or this career? Yeah. Right. And and so people, I think, easily get overwhelmed. And and this is where taking a vacation helps. Is that you get kind of completely submerged in this idea that okay, what's the next paper? What's the next grant? And it's easy to lose track of, oh, the reason that I'm here and I'm doing this is because I really think the indoor environment is very important in asthma and that it's, we need to understand, you know, how to uh, manage asthma through managing the environment. Like that's, that's my whole big picture. And I think people lose that big picture and it's easy mm -hmm. to lose that big picture when you're in a place of insecurity, mm -hmm. where resources are poor, or you're just starting out your career. Um, but I think there's a danger to success when you lose that kind of meaning or whole purpose behind, you know, why you're pursuing a career in academia that has a research component. Yeah. Does that make no, a little I, bit of sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with, I mean. So I think that plays into why people um, kind of go after the, the money as well is because they lose the whole – because if you look at all the grants that you could apply for, 
if you look at them through the vein of or the, the lens of, you know, what is the problem I'm going to, I want to solve or what's the question, I, you know, my big question I've been kind of pursuing or want to pursue for the next 10 years, only a fraction of those grants are really going to fit with what you want to do and you shouldn't right. apply to the other ones. Right, right. Yeah. I, that said, I do think that there are many people who are in environments that kind of just encourage you to they, apply for everything. They do yeah. promote that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, and I think it's, and I, you know, for example, uh, my department chair will often email, oh, here's a grant opportunity in case anyone's interested. You know, just a simple email, just mass email to the whole faculty, just right. in case someone's interested. Right. Because, you know, maybe someone is. Um, even if I'm not interested, you could kind of see how a message like that could have been interpreted that, you know, maybe you should apply anyway. Right. <laughs> right? Because, right. you know, because... You know, it's an opportunity, and uh, if you you can't you can't get the opportunity if you don't apply for it. Right. right. So, I, and I can so that's a very but that's a very innocent example I think of that type of environment. But I could see other places being uh, where people would perceive much greater pressure. Well, well, there is because yeah. it this goes back to um, counting is much easier than discerning quality, mm -hmm. and your division chief has to go over the financial report of the division with the department chair. Right. The department chair has to go over the financial report right. with the dean. Right. And oftentimes the more quote unquote success you have, which is measured in dollars often, mm -hmm. the more leverage you have to negotiate with, you know, the person who is one layer up in the university to get more resources. Yeah. And so I think it's not I think it goes back to it's not just sort of a cultural phenomenon that has blossomed out of nowhere. It's a cultural phenomenon that has blossomed because it's all about, again, people perceiving that resources on a sort of departmental or you know, school or you know, whatever administrative unit level, because that administrative unit wants to be able to you know, brag about their success yeah. to the next administrative unit up. And one way they do that is to say, we brought in X millions of dollars right. of grant funding. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, so. I, I think maybe the ultimate question now is, you know, as for, at the individual faculty level, you know, what what would you say? To, what do you, what's the advice to that person? And, and one evil piece of advice we could say is just just write more papers, and the ratio will balance out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which, which would mean don't get any more get any sleep, yeah, right? right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So keep applying for all those grants and, and write more papers, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I I think because of you know the the kind of the the numbers tracking and the um, and the dollar tracking, you know, I think there is an element, regardless of where you are as a faculty member, there is an element of resisting, you know, the kind of default urge to just apply for more external funding, um, because no one, in general, no one's going to complain if you bring in money. Right. I, I like. I've never heard it happening, um, unless it's you know money from a strange place. Right. Right. But um, so like so so that kind of psychology is, you know, play is powerful. Um, no one's going to complain if you write a paper either, obviously. But I think um, it's, you know, it's I think uh, it's way more tangible. When, when you see dollars coming in, right? Yeah, right. So, uh, and so you do. Ha I think everyone has to kind of resist the urge to, right, to do that. Well, we just had a discussion about a potential grant, yeah. right? And we are fortunately in a position in our careers where, I think maybe ten years ago, mm -hmm. it would have been a no-brainer, right. to pursue it. Yeah. I don't know. Would you agree? I think so. Yeah. Right. And we now, just written it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now we're probably going to write it, mm -hmm. but we had a lot of discussion about. Well, is this really going to? add to the literature? Mm. Is this something that's going to be important? What are we going to learn from it? And it's actually very refreshing to be in a position to be able to kind of have that discussion. Yeah. And I think um, maybe if I, back in my junior faculty days, if I had thought a little bit more that way, I would be just as fine as I am now <laughs> yeah. and maybe had, n you know, not had a grant to paper ratio right. that was out of whack. <laughs> well, I, well, the, the comment that I made, uh, just as we had this discussion, but I've made this comment to many different collaborators at many different times, is that, you know, ultimately, how excited would you be if you got this grant? And it's surprising how many times that answer is not very excited. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, that's how you know you're just, you know, you're really applying for things that are kind of outside your, 
what you should be doing. You right. Know? Because there are many times where you apply. I, you know, I, I don't, this is not like a controversy. I think there's many times where you apply for grants for the money. Right. Um, and um, and you think, well, it's kind of marginally related to what I do, so it's not like it's you know it's wrong. Well, and you're very unlikely to get that grant when you when you apply when you apply for those kind of grants. Where yeah. You're trying to shoehorn what you do in or try to claim something is yeah. going to be paradigm changing when. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that. You know, if you don't get it, that's bad. But if you do get it, it could be bad too, because then you're saddled with this thing that's kind of not really in your area, and right. you know, and you've committed to all these things. So, um, so I always ask myself that in terms of how excited I'd be to get this grant. Right. Yeah. So, um, so we never figured out the actual ratio, the optimal well, ratio. Well, what do you think it is? I, I don't you, know. I don't even know how to calculate the you're, ratio. You're, you're the you're the number. <laughs> is it numbers of grants to numbers of like, let's say primary authored papers that you generate? You, uh, yes, yeah. I think that would be fine. Okay, because so, like, you know, there could be lots of papers that you are on. Right, right. You don't have right. any hand in writing, for right, example. Right, right. So um, you're the numbers guy. Put a number on it. Well, I, you know, when I started on the faculty here, let me just say, this is not related, not related to grants per se, but, you know, I my goal was that I would have a first authored paper every year. Right. One. One. And um, – it lasted for like six or seven years. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, which I yeah I thought was pretty good, but I've missed the last the couple now. <laughs> You've diversified so. your revenue stream and interests. Yes, I guess that's true. Yeah, um, but anyway, so that was so like you know in, you know we don't do like last author papers that much uh, in Biostat, so um, so like one paper a year is kind of what I was going for. Uh, and, then and then how many grants per year? In terms of to write to you write, write, yeah. I guess it was probably on the order of one. So yeah, about one. Yeah. But so if if that ratio, if the grant to paper ratio exceeded one, yeah, like it was two, mm-hmm. maybe maybe that's you're getting into some not such great territory. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know what the upper bound mm-hmm. for that would be. It'd probably be more than two, mm-hmm. but. Because sometimes, you know, if you average things out, sometimes you just have a year where it's like, oh, it just happens that you wrote a bunch because there were all these right. perfect opportunities. Right, right. Uh, they always come in lumps like that. But um, if you average out to two, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Mm-hmm. But, you know. Anyway. <laughs> Do you have any other thoughts on that? No, oh, that that's, that's my only only thought about the uh the You don't have ratio. a different ratio? I, told, I just have a sense. Like when yeah. I'm interacting with junior faculty and I'm and I see that – there are not very many papers that are coming, you know, across my desk, but there are a ton of grants coming across my desk for yeah. me to review. And the person's earlier in their career, I get a little worried mm-hmm. that it's going to be hard for them to renew the grants that they do have mm-hmm. and that it's going to be harder for them to get promoted. So. Yeah. I'll just make one comment, final comment, which is that I told a senior faculty member my plan of doing one you know, first author paper a year and uh, and he thought I was crazy. Like he thought it was not possible. <laughs> <laughs> and did you sh- did you go to I, him I thought at I the was end? Being, of- being very conservative, right? You know? Did you go so. to him at the end of it and say, "I just want to show you that it was possible"? <laughs> no, were, I, did, were, I didn't rub it in his face. But, but. you were you were tempted. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, no. I, so I know that surprised me because I thought I was being super conservative. Yeah. Like, I, the fact it, of the matter is, I think in you know in traditional s- statistics departments, you would write more than that. Probably. Oh, really? Uh, but in a biostat department, you're, where you're doing a lot more collaboration, so you're co-authors. You're yeah. often a co-author, right. and it doesn't come out that so way. So I think that that's a reasonable. Like you would need to do that in the school of medicine. If you're not getting sort of, you know, a paper out per year, mm-hmm. it's going to be t- tough for you to you know be promoted to associate professor in kind of a reasonable time frame. Yeah, and, and from a, from a practical matter, you know, like in our promotion process, you often have to send out. Couple, like f- three or five papers uh, to, for review, yes. and you typically would want those to be papers that you wrote, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a red have... flag if they're not papers that you wrote. <laughs> yeah, so you know you got to have a few under your belt. Right. You know? okay. All right. Well, I think that's it for episode seven. Yeah. So we and just a what, just a reminder in terms of uh, people can get in touch with us. Right. So we have an email address: the effort report at gmail dot com. We're on Twitter, and the Twitter handle is at the effort report. So feel free to tweet at us. And I think those are the main. There's, yeah. of course, all of Roger has another podcast. Which you can you feel free to listen to. Yes, it's um, not so standard deviations. deviations. Yeah. 
and then simply statistics blog. And I think I think we've just plugged everything. Yeah. Well, right? there's more to plug, but I'll, I'll, uh, okay. I'll keep it. I'll take it. That would take that. a whole podcast yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah. One one day we'll have a podcast that's all advertisements. <laughs> That'll be well subscribed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you.